Hey guys, so yesterday we planted 70,000 bulbs, if you could believe it. But we had some recruits to help us out because there was no way we could actually finish it in one day by ourselves. In early October, we got our big delivery of 70,500 bulbs straight from the Netherlands. Luckily, we were doing some gate fixes on the land, so Sonder was able to drop off the delivery closer to where we would be planting. We decided we would attempt to plant the bulbs a few different ways. First would be taking up the lawn entirely, particularly in an area that needed some grading, and then we would backfill the area with three to four inches of organic compost topsoil mix, which we'd rake over the bulbs evenly. All right, so we just took up a lot of the sod, not all of it, in the central part of the lawn. We're still continuing with that. And the idea is that we're building a bulb coffin there. So we're taking up the sod with the turf cutter, and then we're scarifying the land with some scarifiers, and we're just like prepping it for bulb planting next month. But we took all that sod, I don't know if you could say we upcycled it, <laughs> but, and we drove over it. Because, Compacted. Yeah. yeah, this is going to be um, a berm. It's gonna berm up, very similar to this garden bed. So we'll just have more biomass down below. It means we're not taking this to the compost heap. We're not taking it to the trash bin. We're actually reusing it in the landscape. And then we'll put some compost, compost topsoil and um, composted bark mulch on top of this and it'll be ready for planting. I don't know if this year, but it will be at least for next year. Next would be through the use of a bulb planting machine, which Bill Miller from Cornell University and his team was gracious enough to bring over to demonstrate how you can plant thousands of bulbs in just 10 minutes. And finally, to finish it off, we would use bulb augers on cordless power drills to plant bulbs in more sensitive areas, like around tree circles and on slopes. Since we had quite a bit of rain, it put a wrench in the topsoil compost delivery plans, but we were able to schedule deliveries on drier days too. Okay, so you can see the truck behind me and this was our first load of 20 cubic yards, right over there, of topsoil compost mix. So that's what's going to go on top of some of these planting beds, but also where we dug the quote unquote bulb coffin. So we're going to put the bulbs down underneath where we dug and basically straightened out the land, leveled out the land, and then we're gonna be putting three to four inches of that topsoil compost mix on top of the bulbs because we figured that's like the easiest way to plant thousands and thousands of bulbs. <laughs> so we need five more of these, and I don't think we have enough space to put them because it's been really rainy and wet, and he, his tires are already getting stuck in the mud even though we we put out piles of wood chips there. So Saunders gonna get the bobcat and the bucket and he's going to move the soil up so that we could get at least like three or four loads here. And then we'll have to figure out what to do with the last two loads. Basically, we waited for the weather reports with bated breath on the big bulb planting day, but we really couldn't have asked for better weather. And we had a number of good friends and new acquaintances show up to help. Not to mention Terry and Steven from Stone Bend Farms even showed up to make the whole crew stone oven pizzas. This is basically how the day went down. And what are the bulbs that we're planting, um, roughly speaking? Let me tell you. I worked closely with Peggy Ann and flowerbulbs.com, an educational site for gardeners on all things bulbs, to come up with a list of spring bulbs that are less than eight inches tall, flower from February through May, serve as a great pollinator resource, naturalize easily, and can work well together as a color palette. This included Crocus tomasinianus, Aranthus, Anemone blonda, Chianodoxa, Fritillaria meleagris, Muscari, Tulipo sylvestris, Galanthus, and Corrigulus Beth Evans. Those are all more or less the same size, really which are. will be very helpful for this. This is, you know, we're looking at it, we're kind of hoping for a 40% coverage on this area. I think it's actually, we'll get it a little higher. A number of bulbs per square meter, 200. So that's about 20 per square foot. That's that's a very nice density. Right. 
Um, yeah, we're gonna have a good show. And then is the idea that this is a complete mix, right? So yes. we mix them before we put them in the hopper. Absolutely. Okay, so good. I've got everything divided up, good. but we still need to hand mix them, either in yeah. the bucket of the truck or the wheelbarrow if it's big enough. All right, guys, the first thing we should do yeah, is to I move know. these over here so everything is all in one. What's gonna be interesting, and, and I'll, I'll just say this, is that we, we, we've, we've used that machine a lot and we've planted stuff all over Long Island and up here. So we know a fair amount about the machine, but I, I have to get a sense. This is gonna be half of the number of bulbs, right? Which yes. is how many bulbs? 35,000. 35,000. We're gonna make it work. We're gonna make it work, no problem. So, uh, yeah, this is about as big as we're gonna That's get about right as big as it's gonna get. Yeah. So er everything, that's, that's gonna be fine. Okay, so basically what we're gonna do is Brett came here, gosh, a couple weeks ago, even this out, and then we're basically gonna put some, uh, we put some bulb tone down and we're gonna put the bulbs and then we're gonna create this like, we created this bulb coffin and then basically we're gonna put the, the soil on top, three to four inches, and Brett is going to graciously move this down and then we're going to take hand rakes and rake it in. That's the, that's the plan today. We had folks divide up into two separate groups, one led by Bill and the other one led by Dan. Bulbs are halved as well and then were mixed by each group so that they could be randomly dispersed throughout the lawn area, either by hand or through the bulb machine in order to achieve a natural Stinson style planting, which is the Dutch term for describing bulbs in lawn, which were often displayed in front of stone and brick homes. The nice thing is it is mobile. So let's start putting some of that in there because as bread is filling, we're gonna have to keep moving. Lee, you're cheating on your roses. <laughs> <laughs> we won't tell them. <laughs> I'm home stinking of bulbs. I know. And now, you know, I'm thinking I need to underplant the roses with bulbs. <laughs> oh, there you go. Oh my God, it looks so fun. So Peg's bringing over buckets. So like I say, we can just scoop up, let's just say half a bucket, set it aside. <clears throat> and we'll scoop up the next bucket. Half a bucket, set it aside. And this will begin to give us a sense of our, of what we have to work with. And I'll keep mixing as we go. I really brought in the Dutch weather. I know, right? I said that to Sander. Yeah. This is like 4th of July in the Netherlands right I now. Know. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, a really great 4th of July. We will split them in such a way that we have three more boxes. So that will reduce the, the weight of what we have to put into the tractor. So that's how many? That's 37, 35,000. One, two, three, four, five, six. 6,000 per box, and that's about right. I mean, that's, that's about how many, 5,000 would normally come in a black plastic crate. All right, team. One last review, just to make sure we're all on the same page. This is a path. Anything that is lawn will remain lawn. They're gonna plant over there on that side, but this edge is our edge here, okay? Path, bulb bed, let's hit it. We're gonna have plenty of bulbs up here. All right, steel rake time. That's much better. That's what we're after. That's a good job. <laughs> what we're doing here is since we're planting so many bulbs in this area, rather than drilling hundreds, actually thousands of holes to plant these bulbs, we're doing it on moss. The soil has been peeled back and we've distributed the bulbs naturalistically, different spacing, different densities. 
And to that, we're adding a mix of compost and topsoil. Nice light. And we're raking a grade about three or four inches over top of that, which would ideally be the depth that we would be planting in, into the ground. But just because we have a good team here, and we've got a lot of bulbs and a lot of area to cover, we're doing it in this sort of mass production style, but still mass production by hand. And, and what's the density of bulbs you want? Because if I look at this area here, mm -hmm. is that about enough? Like or? That is enough for what, for what we're after. We're after a natural dispersion. Okay. Nature doesn't plant in straight lines. Nature doesn't plant consistently. Nature varies. And we're trying to replicate nature in that way. And in the next few years, as some of these bulbs begin to seed, that dispersion, that density will change. It's a dynamic project right here. And over the next few years, frankly, the next potential 100 years, it's continue, gonna to continue to change. A little thicker, is that thicker? Little, a little bit. Give me about a quarter of that. That's good. But Brett, in general, I think you're okay. Right, so you've put bulbs over here to the left, so he still has to drive. We've left the cavity so that he can come in and access. Yeah. Once he gets those covered, then we're going to plant bulbs in that cavity, yeah, see, yeah, and we're going to continue to sort of work our way out of this bed. Yeah. Because, uh, can you step on the bulbs, or will that destroy them? We can step on the bulbs if necessary. And actually that piece of equipment, by virtue of those very large tracks, despite its weight, has a very gentle footprint. So as long as we are gentle in the way we step on the bulbs, a human it's absolutely fine. Even that equipment, straight line is fine. It's when you begin to move, that's where the crushing action happens. But basically, this is a small bulb on soft ground, and certainly when the grade is on top of it, there's no problem at all. That gets this up to about 10. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, it's better. It's okay. a lot better. Yeah, okay, good, good. It, it's always interesting estimating the numbers. What was described to me is the exhibition density of bulbs mm -hmm. is, is, that's beautiful, but it's sometimes more than what you necessarily need for a nice ecological impact. Yeah, I yeah, think you're right. Yeah. So what we're kind of going so. for, it's a 40% coverage yeah. for this first year, which yeah. is a big, yeah. it's a big show. Yeah, um, oh, it's gonna be these, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, and all of these uh, will multiply quickly. I propose that we start in this area okay. first because they're working over there and these uh, hills of soil, maybe they get yeah. knocked down in the meantime. So we'll start here first. Yeah. yeah, okay, so Luke, we need the tractor over there so we can load in five crates of bulbs. Into, into the... This is so exciting. Uh, this is so exciting. I don't know what we're going to do. My, my big take on this is that this is really special because bulb people hardly ever see mixes of bulbs. I know. You know, the, the, the big time uh, forcing exporters. Right. It's all monoculture. It's all... And that's fine, it's, but it's all one kind of tulip. But these, these things are just... Isn't this is awesome? fantastic. Yeah. That's beautiful. It really is. Uh, we no, we can't start loading things yet, because I have to go get the uh, the, gate. the gate. I started my Advil drip last night. <laughs> <laughs> All right, why don't we have? To, why don't you finish out this lobe in here, this side of the transformer, and then we're going to switch gears to soil again. Jesus, God, Luke, yep. <laughs> get on it, Luke. Oh. But this is this is twenty thousand more or less. Don't quote me on the numbers. There you go. Now in, in Holland, there are companies that do this. This is what they do. They plant bulbs under grass uh, all over Europe for cities, towns, municipalities, parks. 
And it's really quite interesting because again, you end up with these mixes of bulbs and the companies that do this, they're, they're pretty advanced and they have unbelievable imagery and public relations. And so they, they'll put in these plantings and by, by having different species and cultivars of bulbs, you spread out the bloom time from the very earliest, like Aranthus, winter aconite, yeah, and, and crocus all the way through to uh, these tulips at the end. Yeah. And so you can get, yeah, you can get three months almost. And they take pictures of the same plantings at intervals and they put those pictures in their PR so that people can see what they look like. Yeah. And they have mixes that are, that are color schemed, that are uh, pollinator friendly, everything. Um, and they do a very nice job of it. Yeah. And they have very interesting facilities where they have basically like a cement mixer and they have conveyor belts that go into the cement mixer and, and you dump uh, 20 crates of this and 10 crates of that and three crates of the other and they all go up there and they tumble around gently and then they let them out so they do all the mixing like a cement mixer kind of. Yeah. And you know, and then it's you, really you interesting. Build, people can do this at home too. You don't Absolutely. Have to do it with the, you know, tens of thousands. No. This is great under deciduous trees and shrubs yep. where they're yep. going to get the light early and you, you know, if you they don't have to mow it, you know, exactly. until the end of June. Well, that, that's one of the big things is that is that it it reduces the mowing, numbers of mowings. And we've been, you might not know about this, but we've been doing research at Cornell for the last four and a half years looking at, at the earliest mowing date. Because of course, you're not supposed to mow this stuff until the leaves all turn yellow. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that you, you can mow things earlier than that with, without, without affecting future years flowering. That is so, new research. So we, we have trials where we have mowed for three years running, and this year was the, was the third year of return flowering after mowing treatments the year before. I need and, to and read this. well, you you yeah yeah I can I can certainly it's it's really quite interesting and yeah. and when you say mowing how t how tall are you leaving the grass? Well, when we when we mow we we mow to be fairly tall because we don't have refined turf grass where these these two particular trials are so we probably mow about three inches tall. But the reality is, when, once you mow a bulb, the, the, these crocus, you know, when they, when they flower, a crocus leaf is only four or five centimeters, couple three inches long. And by the time it gets time to mow it, you know, it's, it's like this. So the, the height of the mowing, I don't think has any effect on, on how the bulb perceives that. I think once it's been mowed, it's all over. Yeah. And then, the, of course, the other thing are the pollinators, you know, you, you know, the crocus and, and other really early things because it's a, it's a, turf grass, is, it's a desert for yeah. pollinators. Right. And I see this so. in my own yard. I mean, they start early. They are all over the crocus. They're all over the snowdrops. Um, they love the anemones. They are yeah. all over the yeah. place and they need food early. And these are the earliest things. The, this is the earliest th stuff that's out there for yeah. sure, for sure. And for and, me, it's food for the soul, man. I, I need to see these to know spring's coming. Yep, yeah. And and like you said about homeowners, you can do this easily with these ball boggers. Yeah. And, and a good, a good DeWalt uh, cordless drill, you know, a 20 volt drill, it will it will make a couple hundred holes e even even on one of those small batteries. Yep. So it, it's a really effective way to do this. Yeah, we use Power Planter, they're made in America. Yeah, Power, really pa good pa plant. that's yeah. what we have. And I'll tell you what, it's the fastest, easiest way yeah. to plant bulbs or, you know, uh, annuals or whatever. Yeah. This is just beautiful, huh? Danielle, what do you think? Isn't that fantastic? And these are Fritillaria meleagris. They're they're a little checkered uh, bulb. Um, they're they're a small cousin of Fritillaria imperialis, which the crown imperial, which has really tall flowers. Yeah. Okay, we should start planting, shall we? All right. We'll just set it so that so that it's just on the edge of the uh, of the, uh, the the white line. Okay, go ahead, go ahead and open up your gate there. Or it is open, never mind. Probably a little deeper.
Is is the is the belt working? Okay, we want to have somewhere around 12 or 15 bulbs per foot of travel. Okay. Uh, that's good. It could probably be just even slightly shallower. Maybe. Just a little bit. Uh, can we put some uh, put some weight on the back tires with your top link? Yep. So, Gil, how does this work? Well, this works by this vertical disc slices the turf, and then there's basically a plow shoe with wings that go off to either side and that lifts the turf up and then underneath underneath where this turf is rolling along the bulbs are dropping through this chute right here you can't you can't literally see the bulbs drop because of that chute but you can see them dropping from the top and then the wheels at the back uh, press everything back down And that's how it works. I take it up even a little bit more. We're going to go over some of the basics involved with augering, or that is drilling holes and planting bulbs in a more conventional way. So this morning we did mass planting, peeled the soil back, threw down bulbs, and backfilled over the top of it. And many of us would get down on our hands and knees and using a little a shovel, a little trowel, or a little digging knife and plant many bulbs too. That's fine. But when we still have several hundred more bulbs to plant, we're going to keep going in a little mass production style. And that's where these power augers come into play. Now, if you notice, Lee and I are using nothing more than basic cordless drills. I happen to be using a DeWalt, it's one I've used for years, but any good cordless drill is going to be able to do this job. Now cordless drills have a few things that make them in common. They often have different speeds. We're going to operate on a low speed that gives high torque or high power and not a lot of speed, but that's what we need. High power and a lot of control. There's also a forward and reverse button. So if you keep drilling for a while and you're not making a hole, chances are you may be working in reverse. And then lastly, there's a clutch. And generally that's a numerical collar around the drills. And what you wanna find is an icon of a drill or a straight line or an arrow. And that indicates it's deactivating the clutch and giving direct drive. That means all the power and torque is going to the auger. Now we're using an auger from the power planting company, uh, power planter company. It's a very good strong shaft that mounts soundly into our drills. It has a good spiral on that. You're going to get several months of bulb planting um, durability out of that and a slight point just to keep us accurate in the hole. That's the, uh, that's the gist of <clears throat> the equipment itself. And now into technique. Lee and I were just talking about the fact that we've used tools like this in the past and sometimes though, when you're drilling, you may hit a rock or a root and that's not unusual. So you have to be ready for that drill to bind and it'll take your arm and take your wrist and maybe even take your shoulder with it. So one of the techniques I like to do and Lee's gonna demonstrate with me is we really, we square up on the drill. We have our hand on the trigger as necessary, but I like to put a second hand on the body of the drill and we really just physically put it in contact with our legs and then descend into the hole. See, that's what happens. But Lee was ready, he was squared up, so when it broke loose, he was ready to, to deal with that. And so one of the things I like to do 
is if you get bound up, if you can pull it free, that's great. Otherwise, you switch into reverse mm -hmm. and then back yourself out of the hole. Gotcha. But as we're drilling holes, squared up, soundly holding on to it and ready for it to twist, use my, I use my knees mm -hmm. rather than my lower back. I descended the hole that way, and see, I bound up, but I was ready to absorb that. We back out, and we try again. It's nice when you hit a soft spot. Soft spots are great, we love <laughs> soft spots. But what we're hitting are tree roots, rocks, and other underground obstacles that we're not aware of. And obviously, if you have water lines or electric lines, you wanna make sure to mark those, or at least be very aware of where they are too. So, Lee, we got some bulbs to plant. Here goes. Let's dig some holes. All right, so we're just gonna put a little bit of bulb fertilizer in the base of each hole. That's important because the middle nutrient uh, doesn't move through the soil. So we want those in close proximity to the bulbs. That's the middle nutrient? What do you mean by that? The middle nutrient. <clears throat> Most bulbs will have a rating. Excuse me, both fertilizers, bulb fertilizer or any kind, have, a, have three numbers. Nitrogen, potassium, excuse me, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, it's the middle number. That is the one that really uh, helps with flowering. It's the easiest way to do it. The middle one is for the flower. And we want bulbs for the flowers. So it's important that we get that middle nutrient. Um, so that's in, why you have five. So five is the amount compared to the other. It's a, a proportion, it's a ratio or proportion to the other ones, okay? but. Just remember that the middle number does not move in the soil. That is, water doesn't move it down. So it needs to be in the hole. That's oh, why we put it under the bulbs out here. And we have the opportunity to get it close to the bulb now. Since we are still working with that naturalizing mix where we have a variety of different bulbs in there, we're gonna take a very small handful of an assortment, throw them in. A few in there, another mix. A few in here another mix. And notice that the spacing on the holes is not regular. It's not in a straight line and they will vary. And that variation is much more natural looking. And then when they emerge, it will seem natural. And that's essentially what we're going to do several hundred times now that's to it. carry this on. And then you cover it up. And then we'll cover this up with a little bit of the nice soil that we have at hand. Yeah, how should just you do a little, Just, just, cover it just up a little like cover. Like, I like to do a little push so okay. that maybe some uh, rodents in the area, squirrels, rabbits or something. Yeah, they like to dig those. We up. wanna push those down just a little bit to make it that much more difficult for them to get to. Now, do you water this afterwards or what, what do you, you have to do the to make this? Like, we have the opportunity, that's a very good question. We have the opportunity, for example, when we're finished today to set up a sprinkler. Uh, I think that's the best overhead to sort of settle the soil. Or if there is a good impending rain in the next two to three days, I wouldn't wait much longer than that. Okay. That's really ideal. There's nothing to substitute the rain, but sometimes we need to supplement. Uh, what if does the rain really do in this case? Does otherwise the bulb dry out, or does it really like lock it in the soil? Or again, the purpose of the rain? again, that's a very fair question. The rain has much more to do with the soil stability, packing that soil around those holes, settling the grade. The ground itself, the soil around it, will keep moisture in the bulb, and that will prevent it from drying out. But keep in mind right now, in October and November, before the ground gets cold and freezes, this is when these little bulbs are actually putting their roots out, now, okay? And if there is moisture in the soil, it will just help those roots penetrate and get engaged. Um, and that's, that's an ideal situation. And then what happens when it gets winter? Because it gets really, really cold, the ground may freeze up to which is absolutely fine. These bulbs are act these bulbs will freeze. Simply their metabolism stops, okay? Their root production stops and they freeze and that is ideal because they are frozen into the ground. Those pesky squirrels and rabbits that we talked about cannot dig in there. They are frozen and locked in there. And they need that cold dormancy. That's one of the challenges. We in the northern tier or even to the mid-Atlantic enjoy bulbs, but as you go south they don't have the cold dormancy, and they don't really do bulbs very well because they're not cold enough in the winter. So we may complain a little bit, but we get bulbs in the springtime and they don't. Right. Um, so water, yes, water is very important for 
soil stability and establishment, root development, and then again in the spring, uh, simply so they can emerge. Because, you know, from that tiny bulb, a large plant emerges, and there has to be some water to make that happen as well. And every year returns? Since we have, since we have a nice cross-section of different bulbs in here, there is a high probability that every one of these cultivars, these selections, are going to return. Now keep in mind, the list that we chose is based on that perennial nature, that returning nature, okay? There may be a soil chemistry issue or a weather issue that may preclude one bulb from succeeding, but we still have 10 more that are going to, that are going to succeed. Right. So we're really increasing our chances by this assortment. And then uh, those that do succeed will set seed and increase constantly. I see. So this isn't a display for one year. This is not a display for one decade. This is for multiple decades. Wow. Um, you know, they say, you know, plant a tree and generations beyond will enjoy it. Well, naturalizing bulbs, it's really pretty similar too. That's incredible. There's a lot. There's a big story in these little bulbs. There really is. Okay, so this is the area that we basically created the bulb coffin. <laughs> That's what I'm calling it. It's under the oak. We removed all of this sod because it actually had to be graded anyway. It was annoying Sonder from the fa for the fact that it was just had all these pits and mounds. It was really hard to mow. It was getting wet in certain areas. And so we basically trucked in some uh, organic compost and topsoil mix, and um, we used the sod to build up another area that we could do a garden bed. So the sod did not go to waste. And yeah, we put in the majority of bulbs here. You could see there's actually some in the distance. So some of them didn't get covered by the sod. So we're gonna have to go in there and maybe bulb auger them in. And then we actually had um, the tractor come in and put the bulbs in this lawn, but you could see the lawn got all beat up. So we're going to take some of that topsoil compost and um, try to even it out ourselves with just like a, a little wheelbarrow. So nothing too high tech. But one of the places that we couldn't actually put the bulbs, that we were planning on putting the bulbs, is this slopey area right here. And maybe you can't tell that it slopes down, but it slopes down into the um, large pond over here. And basically, uh, Luke and Bill, who came with the tractor to do the bulb planting with the tractor, didn't want to tip the tractor. It doesn't do so well on slopes. It only does pretty well on, on a, on a flat terrain, basically. So uh, this was not bulbed up. So we're just gonna have straight up old lawn right here. But you'll see in the distance that we were able to get maybe a little less than a quarter acre with bulbs, but still it'll just, we'll just have more bulbs in one area than, uh, than we were planning, which is fine because it usually takes a while for the bulbs to have any sort of density, but we'll have to be patient and see what they look like in the spring. If you haven't heard yet, we'll be donating and investing 10% of our YouTube AdSense revenue from this channel back into the Finger Lakes community. We're so thankful that Espoma, our partners across both Plant One On Me and Flock Finger Lakes channels, will be matching those funds this year, as well as through a combination of monies and or products, depending on the project. So just know that by watching these videos, you're helping the community here.